Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 12 says, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of, my, of thy paths. Let's pray. Father, please be with the reading of your word today, the sermon that you've put on my heart. Let it be as unto the Lord, and not for men's sake. Help us to listen with an open mind and to heed these words, to love the things you love and to hate the things you, that you hate. Amen. Amen. I'm going to bring a, a sermon today entitled, The Feminist Assault on the Patriarchal Family. It's sure to be a very politically incorrect sermon. Amen. But I believe it's one that is necessary, um, even in churches, because there is a movement that has deemed patriarchy a bad word. It's a dirty word now, patriarchy. And uh, women have been quote unquote liberated so that they don't need to follow the leadership of men. And uh, man's rule no longer has a place, it seems, in modern Western society. And patriarchy is a word that can just be relegated to the ashes of history. Unfortunately, this is not the view of the Bible. It is 100% diametrically opposed to it, in fact. Amen. First, let's define a couple terms here, starting with, of course, the word patriarch. Originally, a patriarch was a man who exercised autocratic authority. Now, in defining this term, I want to define autocracy, autocratic authority. Autocracy is a system of government in which supreme power is concentrated in the hands of one person, whose decisions are subject to neither external legal restraints nor regularized mechanisms of popular control. So there are, are, ni are neither external factors that can govern over this person, nor is there a popular vote as to what this person will deem necessary in his government. That is autocratic. So patriarch, originally a patriarch, was a man who exercised autocratic authority as a paterfamilias over an extended family, the system of such rule of families by senior males is termed patriarchy. The word is a compound of the Greek words patria, meaning family, and archaine, meaning to rule. A patriarch is a man who rules autocratically over his family. And this is the method by which God chose to lead families, which are themselves in turn the building block of our society, and therefore God's economy. The family make no mistake, is under attack today. Amen. And feminism is one of the most subtle lies the devil has incorporated into this full-on assault on God's design Amen. and on God's family. In the past few generations, a very seducing, deceptive spirit has crept into our culture and our, even our, our churches, and it questions the wisdom of God's chosen hierarchy. Why would God do this? Maybe God's a sexist. Maybe we don't understand our Bible. Maybe our Bible is no longer relevant in society. That's what this lie essentially claims. And it, it endangers the, fa the father-led family unit, which must be defended. In the Bible, here in Isaiah, in fact, the Bible says that, God, that uh, it is a sign of judgment when women lead and when women rule over us. He berates Jerusalem in Ezekiel 16, and he calls her an imperious, whorish woman. These are insults. You ever notice that word imperious? Imperious means to rule, to dominate. Think of the term empire or imperial. An imperious, whorish woman is an unfaithful woman who is not only unfaithful, but she's also domineering and seeks to rule over a man. And that's what God called his unfaithful bride, Israel, in the book of Ezekiel. And it was considered an insult, not a compliment. <clears throat> and yet somehow today, women are encouraged to lead, while masculinity and the leadership of men is considered, quote-unquote, toxic. Now let me ask you something. How can a design of man, or of God rather, that he instilled in men, that of masculinity or leadership, how can such a quali quality be toxic? Of definition, of necessity, it must be God-ordained. Can it be abused? Of course. But toxic masculinity does not 
actually refer to an abuse, but rather an application of this masculinity or leadership. Feminists today have decided that when men actually want to lead over a woman, that it's toxic, it's damaging, that it's dangerous, and it must be spoken out against and eliminated from our society. Yes, chauvinist, male chauvinist. I am a card-carrying member of the Male Chauvinist Club, and that doesn't mean that I hate women. It simply means that I believe men are to lead over the women as God's provisional plan, not as an insult to the woman, but as a protection, as a blessing to the woman. And we're going to get into that. The feminist movement pretends to liberate women, and I would like to destroy that lie once and for all. The women's liberation movement does anything but liberate them. In fact, it enslaves them and makes them miserable, depressed, unfulfilled, and confused. It does not liberate them. It is an ungodly liberation that, in fact, leads to enslavement, to sin. The feminist movement seeks to restore to women, it's, it claims that they want to give women certain rights that they believe are fundamental human rights uh, to both men and women, and that is the right to a voice in secular government, aka women's suffrage, the vote, uh, the right to work alongside and in leadership over men. They want to give women the right to choose whether or not to let their offspring even be born. Amen. They want women to have the right to be equal to men in every way, yet the Bible says women do not have a single one of those rights. Right. Not a single one of them. You will not find women partaking in their government throughout the scriptures, with one or two notable exceptions, right? As a general rule, women are not to be in leadership positions. They are not to work alongside or, or over a man. They are not to usurp authority over the man. They are to be the man's help. They are certainly not to have the, de the final de de decree over whether or not their baby lives. I mean, murder is murder, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. And I would also like to point out, with qualification here, that women are not, quote-unquote, equal to men. This is not to say that they are less human. This is not to say that, that men are somehow superior. It is merely to reference the hierarchy that God has established. Equal implies the same. And if we are the same, then why use the terms male and female? We are obviously not the same, and therefore we are not equal. We are different. We are both equal at the cross. We are, there is no male or female at the cross. But there is in society a very different thing between a man and a woman. There are many differences between a man and a woman. Therefore, I do not believe in equality in any sense when referring to the feminist movement. Be not deceived. The lie of feminism is 100% an assault on God's order, authority, his, his hierarchy, his patriarchy. And the end result has never been about giving women the vote or getting them equal wages. Um, it has and always will be been about the complete destruction of God's family Amen. and his order. God is ordered. Let all things be done decently and in order, the Bible says. And God has an order. And he expects it to be followed. And when it is followed, only then can we find true freedom. God's ways are best, are they not? I mean, we believe that as Bible believers, right? His yoke is light. Amen. God has decreed that men are his representative authority in this world. And that's why they are in the crosshairs of the feminist movement. They need to be assassinated, according to the feminists, because their very sex represents God's authority on this planet. And that's why there is an anti-man under, underlying theme within the third wave feminist movement. It is about being anti-man. Now they will say, many of them will say, well, it's, no, it's about equal rights for everyone. Sounds very good, right? And yet, if you listen to some of the quotes that these women, that some of these men even, uh, actually say about men, it's very, chi very chilling. They have something against men. And I would, I would like to point out that I think what they have against men is that men represent God's authority on this planet. Men are biologically inclined to lead. They are divinely sanctioned to lead. And therefore, they are a target because they are, represent God's order, his hierarchy. God has equipped them to lead. He's given them the nature that they need to lead. And yet, because of the fall, because of Adam's sin, generally we see a reversal of this. Gener generally in our society, the man wants to be lazy and sit on the couch, right. and the woman wants to take the bull by the horns. 
That is not our divine nature. That is our fallen nature. So let's look at some of these quotes. Is it really just about equal rights? Well, here's the editor of uh, Miss or Ms. Magazine, I should say. Can't even call themselves Mrs. Miss, Ms. Magazine, Robin Morgan, as cited in Forbes Magazine. She said, I feel that man-hating is an honorable and viable political act, that the oppressed have a right to class hatred against the class that is oppressing them. She says, men are oppressing us, therefore I hate men, and it's okay to hate men. She's the editor of one of the most prominent feminist publications in the West. The Nuclear Family, this is by Linda Gordon, another feminist author as cited in The American Thinker. She said, the nuclear family must be destroyed. Remember, this is about the family. This is not about liberating women. This is about enslaving the family, dissolving it. The nuclear family must be destroyed and people must find better ways of living together. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families now is an objectively revolutionary process. Families have supported oppression by separating people into small, isolated units, unable to join together to fight for common interests. There's a lot of religious undertones here if you pay attention. You know, separating people, God wants to keep us separated so we can't build a town, I mean, so we can't function in society. You know, God's just trying to keep us oppressed with this family unit. You know, God's ways are best, Amen. and the family is without a doubt his way, his method, his unit, building block of society, and that's what's in the crosshairs here. Men, as the leaders of the family, and therefore that which holds them together, and the family itself, as God's chosen method of organizing society. Here's one from Sheila Cronin, a prominent feminist, cited by Kay House. Since marriage constitutes slavery for women, it is clear that the women's movement must concentrate on attacking this institution. These are not my words. These are the feminists themselves saying this. She went on to say, freedom for women cannot be won without the abolition of marriage. So marriage itself is, at, is under attack now because marriage is oppressive to women apparently. This has never been about equal rights or about getting women the vote or about better wages for women, this has always been about assassinating God's hierarchy and destroying the family, Amen. destroying marriage as the most ancient institution ordained by God. The Declaration of Feminism, a watershed document that came out in 1971, right at the beginning of the surge of feminism, cited by ShatteredMen.com, they, they quote, marriage has existed for the benefit of men. Oh, so men are the only ones who, do, who, who benefit from marriage. That's interesting. And has been a legally sanctioned method of control over women. We must work to destroy it. The end of the institution of marriage is a necessary condition for the liberation of women. Therefore, it is important for us to encourage women to leave their husbands and not to live individually with men. All of history must be rewritten in terms of oppression of women. We must go back to ancient female religions like witchcraft. Right. That's in the quote. Wow. They admit, they flat out admit, that marriage, the family, are the enemy. And that when we overthrow them, we need to completely leave men behind. Why? Well, because they represent God's authority. And to go back to witchcraft and the occult. Right. That's where this is ultimately heading. This is just one of, God, of, of Satan's chosen methods to overthrow God's methods and God's order and bring about Lucifer's new world order. That's what this is headed to. Andrea Dworkin, a feminist author, as cited by World News Trust, said, only when manhood is dead, and it will perish when ravaged femininity no longer sustains it, only then will we know what it is to be free. So it seems that this is a, a call for, for freedom, from emancipation, from the evil tyranny of men. The stated goal of the feminist movement, as we've seen from these quotes, has always been about assassinating the patriarchy. Even using the word patriarchy today is, is offensive. You're not even supposed to use the term, really, because it's, it's negative, it represents slavery and oppression, and it's about establishing their own mutinous hierarchy in defiance of God's laws. That's what this is all about. Their message, the feminist message, essentially is helping to create the chaotic conditions needed 
to usher in Lucifer's New World Order. They are trying to break down the order of the family to break apart that nuclear family. And then when no one has, when no one has that direction, that confidence, that training, that upbringing, that security, they are vulnerable to attack by Satan. They are then more likely to follow him into the, the age of Aquarius, right. the dawning of a new world order. That's where this is headed. They do not merely want the vote or equal pay. Ultimately, they want a complete reversal of societal norms, the dissolution of marriage and family, and an all-out war with God himself. That's where this is headed. Some of these quotes may have sounded rather familiar if you're familiar with the... Um, the New Age or the New World Order movement. If you've seen some of these quotes from Satanists, um, Luciferians, you'll notice some of these terms sound rather redundant. They sound rather familiar. Let me read to you a very famous quote for those who study the New World Order and the occult. Mikhail Bakunin was a Grand Orient Freemason, a disciple of Illuminati founder Adam Weishaupt himself, and an avowed Satanist. See if this quote sounds familiar to what the feminists are saying. But here steps in Satan, the eternal rebel, the first free thinker and the emancipator of worlds. He makes man ashamed of his bestial ignorance and obedience. He emancipates him, stamps upon his brow the seal of liberty and humanity in urging him to disobey and eat of the fruit of knowledge. Wow. That is what the devil is up to. Mm -hmm. That is what he's been up to since the beginning. Since the Garden of Eden, he is, he, why do you think he targeted Eve? He was trying to circumvent the order that was already established. He didn't go to the spiritual head of the family. He went to Eve. And he said, make a decision. And she did. And in that moment, she became both the material and the spiritual provider of her home. And mankind was doomed. Because that was not her place. God never intended for her to have to make that decision. That's what Adam was there for. Hollywood filmmaker Aaron Rousseau, who some of you may have heard of, he was the, uh, let's see, he, he made a few films. One of them, I believe, was The Rose with Bette Midler. He was an insider in Hollywood, which is, of course, given over to the devil in the New World Order. And he rubbed shoulders with a lot of these, uh, these elitists. One of them was a, a member of the Rockefeller family. Had a very interesting conversation with this Mr. Rockefeller one time, who opened up and shared with him some of the plans or some of the, the things that had actually gone down in history and the real scoop behind the story, right? And one of the things he talked about was feminism. He mentioned that the, the Rockefellers had actually funded it from the beginning. They had contributed to their publications, their movements, even their, their professors and, and universities. And he explained why. Why did they have a vested interest in investing financially in this movement? which they say will actually lead one day to their new world order, the order that they have been pushing for for many years. He said that there were two reasons that they wanted to give women the vote, get women working in the workforce, etc. The women's liberation movement was about two things, according to the Rockefellers. Number one, they wanted to bring the other half of society onto the tax docket. They wanted the other half of society working in, as wage slaves and paying taxes to the machine. And number two, he said, when the mothers are working, the children go where? The public schools, where we, mind, where we mold their minds. Amen. And we tell them what to believe and what to think and who to vote for and who to support, who to worship. Because make no mistake, the, the public school system is a religious organization Amen. inherently. Right. And it is committed to preaching the religion of humanism and right. Satanism, ultimately. Amen. Statism, exactly. Statism is, is fundamentally what public schools exist to push. And that statism is inherently religious in itself. That statism is based on and predicated on satanic principles. And feminism is simply a useful tool to play women against their emotions, to play their emotions against them, to actually tell them one thing and then turn around and give them the other. Women have been promised liberation and freedom from oppression, happiness and fulfillment once you achieve your full potential going out into the workforce, leaving your children behind. And what do they find when they get there? They're not happy after all. Go figure. And meanwhile, their children are sitting at the seat of the scornful. Their husband doesn't have a warm meal. He doesn't have the nurturing support of his wife. There is no real nuclear family anymore. Everyone's off at the softball practice or at the game or at the concert or at the office. And there is no more family. 
They're just sitting there vulnerable, confused, frustrated, and being taught the, the, the Luciferian plan for the future. That was straight from Mr. Rockefeller, who told Aaron Rousseau, a Hollywood producer, who was rubbing shoulders with these insi powerful insiders at the time, feminism says that you can have it all, right? Women, you can have the family and you can have the career. Anything a man can do, women can do, plus have babies. That is nonsense. If you try to, to stretch yourself between these two, you're not going to be good at either. And that, the devil knows that. He knows if he can get you out of the kitchen, if he can get you out of your home, if he can get you away from your children, and have you chasing a selfish dream of a career or leadership over a man, then you're not going to be very good at either. You're definitely not going to be fulfilling your God-given ordination, calling. Amen. And you're going to be unfulfilled. Feminism has left in its wake a complete loss of identity for women. They don't know who they are anymore. They're trying to compete in the world of men. Some of them do okay in terms of monetary compensation. But for the most part, even to this day, I would say, in my opinion, women have still not yet attained to the... Uh, commercial heights achieved by men. I'll, I just can't wait to see that clip played over on YouTube. I know that was a rather <laughs> sexist soundbite. And yet I believe it's true because they were not equipped to be men. They were not given the tools to excel as men. So when they enter the world of men and try to act like men, don't expect for them to actually be any better than men at being men. And what's worse, they don't know what to do when they get home. They can't fully keep their, their children under their control. They can't keep their home. They can't keep their husband. They can't, atten they can't tend to the things that God has equipped them for because they don't have the time. They don't have the energy. They're, they're split between two worlds. They think they can have both. And in the process, they've lost both. They can't be good men. And in, in, the, in the process of trying, they can't be very good women. And so they have this loss of identity. They don't know who they are. And so they're depressed. They're unfulfilled. They're frustrated. And the home and the family suffers. Because women don't know who they are. They don't know what their calling is. Feminism has left in its wake a daycare epidemic. Where children who are in their earliest years need more than anything that nurturing, compassion, and soft, gentle care of a mother who not only teaches them, but also just loves them as her own offspring. You know, the Bible talks about in the end times, people being without natural affection. I believe that's what daycare is. I understand there are sometimes extenuating circumstances, but when you make a choice to go into a career and leave your babies behind, that is na without natural affection. And your children will suffer for it. Don't lie to yourself. Children do suffer from losing out on that motherly love that God equipped women to have. You know, men aren't quite as soft and loving and gentle as women. It's just the way we were made. God equipped us for other things. Now, I love my children. I try to be loving to them. Yet I am not going to be as good at meeting that need as my wife. I never was intended to be that way. God intended them to have both the man in their, in their life, giving them the structure, the discipline, the guidance, and the woman, giving them that love and nurturing. We are both important in our own spheres. But feminism has taken out the female from the equ equation and left in its wake a daycare epidemic. It's also resulted in men giving up on women. Do you know there's a lot, there's actually a movement right now of men who have stopped looking for a wife. They don't date. They don't go out anymore. I'm talking about in the lost world. This is a phenomenon that has been documented by uh, Infowars and, and others who have seen that men are not actually talking to women anymore. They're tired of it. They're tired of competing with women. They'd rather just sit at home and play video games. So they don't have families. They don't marry. They don't interact socially except with maybe their roommate guy, friend who's playing video games with them. And so our society is literally dying because we don't have the male-female dynamic anymore because of feminism. On the other hand, we have more workplace affairs because we've now placed men and women in intimate positions of working together, sometimes late hours, sometimes alone together. And what shock that they would actually have an affair and commit adultery when they spend more time with someone else's spouse than with their own. What do you expect? 
That is the, that is the wake of feminism. That is what feminism actually delivers. It promises one thing, but it delivers something entirely different. Right. It has paralyzed families. It has left them dysfunctional. They don't have what they need, which is a strong father figure and a strong mother figure. And so they're dysfunctional. They don't raise good children. In fact, fatherless children is going up in this country and in most Western countries. Usually, the, in fact, if you look at the statistics, the countries with the highest rates of uh, employed women uh, where feminism has made the most inroads, you will find that they have the highest rates of fatherless children. What is that doing for the next generation? Well, I think we're in the next generation. This started in the 60s, the late 60s. Right. I think we're already in that generation. God only knows what's going to happen in, in the generations to come. We are losing an entire generation, our, our, our entire society, right. to feminism. And as a process, we're leaving our youth very vulnerable. So it promises that you can have it all. You can be a mother and a man. You can go have your career and your kitchen. You can train up your children to love you, and you can go conquer a business empire. And what does it actually deliver? Chaos, catastrophe, dysfunctional families, broken up marriages, and children who are confused and vulnerable to indoctrination, to mentoring by ungodly forces and, and, and movements. And they're caught up by every wind of, of change because they have no foundation. They've never been raised right because they didn't have a mom. Let's look at a few scriptures and see just what God actually says about women. Because I'm here to tell you, women are vital in God's economy. They are not equal with a man. They are special. And they have lost their specialness. Women are no longer special in society. In some places of the country, they still open the door for a woman, but in many places they don't. Because women are now just another man. They used to be put in a position of esteem. My grandmother used to say, I will not come off my pedestal to be equal with any man. Your grandfather treats me like a queen. Why would I want to be equal with a man? That's what she used to tell me. Because my grandfather cherished her for who she was, a woman, a wonderful creation of God, vital in God's economy, because she didn't try to be a man. She was happy with the office that God had given her, and she tried her best to excel at it. And she knew that my grandfather saw her as someone very special, because she was a woman. Let's see what the Bible says about women. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 11. Think of all of the things that, that the feminine has that the masculine doesn't. You do realize we need both. And in many ways, men are geared one direction, whereas women complement the man in making up those things that he doesn't have, or at least does not have as much of. In general, women are more gentle. They're more nurturing, they're more loving, they're more compassionate, they're more empathetic. There was actually a, a, um, an interesting social experiment you can watch on YouTube uh, where um, men were set up on, a, on a, an online date. They had met someone online. They show up, and the woman is about 100 pounds heavier than she advertised herself online. The men were looking for the door as fast as they could. They turned around and did the exact same experiment with women where the man was 100 pounds heavier than he had advertised. And the women would actually try to find out, you know, maybe there's a reason he deceived me. Um, maybe I can at least try to be his friend. And you would find them actually trying to salvage the situation. That is a characteristic men don't typically have. That empathy, that gentleness, that patience, that everyone should have in some quantity, right? But men generally don't have it in as much quantity as women. Women major on these qualities. And so why would you want to give that up to be a man? 1 Corinthians 11, and starting in verse 7. The Bible says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman but the woman for the man. 
if you read in Genesis 2, you find that the woman was created to be a help for the man. And it says here that she is the glory of the man. So she was made for man. Man was made for God. The Bible says that he is the glory of God. He is the primary creation of God, meant to be his companion. And then woman comes along to help man, because man is an incomplete creation. He needs that woman to complement him, complement, to make up his differences, to make up his, his, his lacking. That's what a woman does. She comes up behind and makes him who he is. And without that, without a woman being everything that God intended her to be, the man will never be everything God intended him to be. She is a crown to her husband, according to Proverbs 12, verse 4. A crown. She is the glory of her husband. Think about that when you hear someone say, oh, well, the Bible is sexist. It's, it's anti-woman. The Bible says that man is the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Think about such an elevated position. Man was created as God's glory, and yet the crown on top of him is the woman. And truly, a woman who is surrendered to God, who is in submission, who has perfected femininity, is a glorious and marvelous crown to her husband. That is what God says about a, a, a godly woman. Secondly, I would point out that she was, as we've kind of already seen in this passage, not God's primary creation. She was his secondary. Does this mean she's subhuman? Of course not. It means she fulfills a different role. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. That's a very strong word, even in an independent Baptist church. All subjection. There's not a lot of room for wiggling on that one. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? For Adam was first formed. He was the primary creation. Then Eve, Eve was the secondary creation. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She is to learn in silence, in all subjection, as her husband, who is the spirit-oriented man, fellowships with his God. She is to have a relationship with God as well, but she is also to be in subjection to her husband and to help him and his relationship with God. Notice, by the way, some people will say, well, this is just talking about the church. She's not to have a voice in the church. You know, and that's what we hear in a lot of conservative circles, trying to be biblical. Well, they'll say, yes, but this passage is talking about the church. I challenge you to find the church anywhere in this chapter. This context is not limited to the church. In fact, he says, why? Well, because they're in church. No, why? Because she was formed after Adam. She is not God's primary creation. And therefore, must remember her place. That is not an insult. That is God's word. Amen. Number three. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. There's that word again, subjection. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation. You can be an example to a lost husband. Amen. Lady, you can be an example. You can win your husband. How? By preaching at him? By telling him how wicked he is? No, by simply being in subjection to him. And by being a godly example of what God wants you to be, not of what God wants him to be. Amen. If you are the best woman you can be, you can help him become the best man that he can be. Amen. Uh, continuing on, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The Bible says a virtuous woman is, her price is far above rubies. A meek and quiet spirit is rare in a woman today. And the Bible says it is of great price. That's usually what makes a commodity expensive, right? That it's rare. And that is very true today among women. There are not many meek and quiet women who are in submission to their husband. And ultimately, that's what femininity is. It is, it is the lack of ego. It is the presence of submission. 
it is the, um, the, the lack of leading, but rather of following. These are characteristics that define femininity. We don't have godly femininity today. Not much of it anyway. And yet the Bible says, uh, actually, let's look at it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to look at quite a few scriptures here over the next few minutes as we see what God actually says a woman is to be. Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, starting in verse 22, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves therefore, or submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You know, it's not sexist to say that Christ is the head of the church or of the man, right? And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. We all have an authority over us. This has nothing to do with sexism. This is simply a matter of God's hierarchy and his order. And we must follow it as Bible believers. And it says in verse 24 that they are sub to submit in everything. In everything. That's a blank check. You're not supposed to be saying, well, I'll tell you what. You can have the finances. I'll run, uh, you know, something else over here. No, no, no. It's not that way. It's not a compartmentalized relationship. The man is the head of the marriage and of the family. And the woman is to submit to that. If she is a godly woman. Oh, well, you don't know my husband. You know, he's, he's crazy or he's, he's not a godly man. He's, you know, I, I, I can't follow him. Well, that's not what the Bible says, actually. The Bible says in all things, and it says, um, oh, you know what? Let's go back to 1 Peter real quick. There's a very interesting point I wanted to make in 1 Peter chapter 3. I should have pointed that out before we moved on. 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, we, were, we just read 1 through 6, but let's look at verses 5 and 6. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God ordained, or, or adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, we, see, we hear this as a joke sometimes in our circles, right? That Sarah called Abraham Lord. It wasn't meant as a joke here. Right. She did call him Lord. She saw him as her Lord because he was the representative of God in her life. He represented God's authority. Whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, I believe that whose refers back to Abraham and not to Sarah. You are the daughters of Abraham, just as all who are born again are the, are the sons and, da and daughters of Abraham. If, if. As long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. If you have been born again and saved from sin and your life is devoted to serving God and his ordained uh, hierarchy, his patriarchy, then you're one of God's children. You're one of Abraham's seed. As long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And so the Bible says if you think your husband shouldn't be followed, perhaps you're not a, a daughter of Abraham. Perhaps you're not of Abraham's seed. Perhaps you need to remember that you are a member of his seed and act like him. Abraham was in perfect submission to God. <clears throat> his wife was in submission to him. And if these are the, the, if Abraham is the patriarch of the faith, we should remember that and we should follow in his example. And we should follow in Sarah's example as well. She was submitted to her husband, to her authority. Let's look over at 1 Timothy chapter 2. No one likes to be told what to do, and it really is um, an exercise uh, in mental gymnastics to try to turn this into a race of the sexes. It's very simple. It's human nature. No one likes to be told what to do. No one likes to have them over someone over them. But that's simply being a believer in the Bible. That's simply following God, submitting to his authority and the authority that he places in your life. This has nothing to do with men hating women or, men, or women hating men or men being better than women or women being better than men. It simply has to do with the Adamic nature that doesn't like to be told what to do. And we need to remember as God's children, we are always going to answer to God and to his authority in our lives. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. I want to make the point that women are more easily beguiled or deceived than men. And we've already looked at this passage, but I want to draw your attention 
to verse 14 where he says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. In the Garden of Eden, it was not Adam who was beguiled. It was Eve. Because Eve was not a spiritually oriented individual, she was not made to be so. She was made to be able to take care of her husband, who was physical, who was carnal. Man was made as a spiritually oriented individual who was to be a companion to God, and therefore man, the man, typically does not become beguiled. He walks into sin willfully and with his eyes wide open. A man typically knows when he's doing wrong, and he chooses to do so. He counts the cost, and he does it. Whereas from Scripture, we find that women, many times, many times they also do it willingly, but many times they're simply deceived. They simply don't have that spiritual discernment. That is not a fault. That is the way God made them. And in his infinite wisdom, God gave them a provider and a spiritual protector, not as an overseer or an oppressor, but as a blessing. God gave Adam to Eve to protect her from, from someone like the serpent. Amen. God gave your husband to protect you from the wiles of the devil. Not as an overseer or as a, as a curse, but as a blessing. The woman is more easily beguiled, according to the Bible. Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived. And she needs to remember that when bucking the authority of her husband in spiritual matters. I have known several women who are extremely spiritually mature and discerning. I would still say, however, that that is an exception to the rule. Women can be extremely discerning. They can walk closely with God. But in general, God has given man the authority to rightly divide the scripture, to study this out and preach, to train up his children, to, to be the protector of his wife. The woman has a personal relationship with God, but she's never commanded to teach men. She's never commanded to go out and, and extrapolate on this and to, make, and to ha pastor a church or anything like that for a reason, because that's not her realm. That's not her particular sphere. God didn't equip her for it. He did the man, though, and he told the men to protect his wife, to protect the women, to, to look out for them, because they are not typically the ones who are deceived. A lot of women, I think, they want to compete in the realm of men, even Christian women, who would, who would say, I am not a feminist, I don't agree with feminism, but, you know, I like going to this Bible study and correcting men. They may not word it that way, but they, they do like to do that. And they like to put men in their place and, 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 and you know, teach. My, <laughs> I, I had a family member, actually, who, uh, while I was growing up, she was very much like that. She, she had to tell every man who ever said anything about the Bible he was wrong. And she took great pleasure in that. And I wouldn't doubt that many times she was right. She did study her Bible. Some of the times I think she was right. Other times she made a fool of herself uh, because she was playing in a, in a realm that she was not intended to be in. Um, there is nothing, I want to clarify now, there's nothing wrong with a woman. In fact, it's, women are to study this Bible. Don't get me wrong. Women are to walk daily with their God. They are to uh, pray, to be spiritual people. They are to grow in spiritual maturity and discernment. But they are not to correct men, and they are not to teach men or to usurp authority over men in spiritual matters, because that's not where God put them. They are to be child rearers, homemakers, nurturers. Let's look over at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Still looking at what the Bible says about women. What is a godly woman? Titus chapter 2 and verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Not keepers at the office, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Do you realize that a woman who is not in submission to her husband, or who is not a homemaker, can lead to... The word of God being blasphemed? That's pretty serious. The harlot in Proverbs, by the way, in Proverbs 7, was described as not abiding in her house. I don't have a problem with a woman making money. In fact, the virtuous woman did. But the Bible teaches that women are to not be career women. They are not to leave their home and, and try to compete in the world of men. They are to be keepers of their home. So their husband doesn't have to. So their husband can go out and sit in the gate and teach men 
or compete in the workplace and bring back the paycheck. That's his, that's his sphere. That's his realm. And it's a lot easier to excel in that realm when he doesn't have to worry about his home being in order. And that's why women are so important in God's economy. They're crucial to the man being everything he can be. And that is where we find true fulfillment and true happiness and true liberation. The women's liberation movement has enslaved women to selfish desires and ambitions that they were never intended to have. And now they are wage slaves. They are slaves to uh, discouragement because they're not in their biblical sphere. <clears throat> um, I would also like to point out, turn to Psalm 113, that feminism has robbed women of the blessings of God by simply letting them overlook them. Psalm 113 We're all familiar with the verse, Psalm 127, where the Bible says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Women are to be child rearers and homemakers, not as a curse, but as a blessing. That's supposed to be God's reward on them. God, when God blesses them with children or a husband or a home to keep, that is a blessing. And feminism has come along and said, oh, you're being oppressed. You're tied down to those children. You can't reach your full potential. And now they look at God's wonderful blessings that he gave them and they say, I have a horrible life. And they're no longer satisfied with God's blessings. They're like paupers sitting on a pile of gold, not even realizing that they're wealthy. The gifts of God have been turned into a, an oppression. Look at Psalm 113 and verse 9. This is a very interesting passage. This is the happily ever after for a godly woman. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God. You have a house to clean. <laughs> you have a kitchen to cook in. You have children who love you. I mean, it doesn't sound in today's society like that's much of a blessing. And yet that's, that's what the Bible says. Praise ye the Lord. He makes the barren woman to have lots of children. He gives her a kitchen to cook in. He gives her a house to keep. That is his blessing on you. And feminism has robbed that from women and told them that it's a curse. That they're kept down by it. That they need to overcome that. And now they go out looking for blessings that aren't really blessings. They're curses. Amen. And they're not sure why they're so unfulfilled in life. They don't know why they're so depressed. They don't know why they fight with their husband and get divorces. Why their husband goes off and has an affair. They don't know why their family's a wreck. Why their children don't love them and want anything to do with them. Because they have rejected the blessing of God. And they have sought their own selfish blessings that are indeed a curse. Woe unto you, Amen. the Bible says. It is a rebuke and a reproach and judgment when women rule over us. Amen. And it's not just a judgment on the men. It's a judgment on the women when women rule. They have lost their fulfillment, their identity. Look over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Women are also to look the part of a submissive, feminine lady. You know, there's not much difference between the way women look these days and the way men look. And that's by design. The first woman to wear pants made the political statement that she was doing so as a sign of rebellion against the patriarchy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 9, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. Hmm, that's an interesting word, isn't it? Shamefacedness. Meekness, right? And sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but, which becometh women professing godliness, with good works. So women are not to be gaudy. They're not to be loud. Uh, they're not to be uh, showbirds. Now, I believe very much that women are to be pretty. God made them that way. And they're supposed to look pretty. But they're not to be flaunting themselves and trying to be immodest and catch the eye of a man or, or these days another woman. They are not to be dressed like men. They're not to be dressed like harlots. Amen. They are to be dressed modestly. And they are to be known by or adorned with good works. Amen. Let's look over uh, at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is a, a passage of some controversy. I, I like to just say, you know, here's what the word says, and, 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 you know, we can disagree on it, I suppose. I don't know where everyone here stands on it, but I believe the, the passage is fairly plain. 
And if we will just read the words themselves, I think they can be known to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to read the first 15 verses. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Interesting. Paul says, follow me. But guess what? I have to follow someone too. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth hath her he with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now what is this covering? Why does she have to be covered? Why can't the man be covered? For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if a uh, but it, if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, don't you love how the Bible often defines its terms? If it's a shame for a woman to be shaved, let her be covered. So being covered is the opposite of being shaved. Therefore, it would stand to reason that this covering is long hair. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Guess what? Even with societal changes today, scientific studies have proven that men still like long hair on a woman. Right. Isn't that interesting? I wonder why. It couldn't be because of social conformity. It's no longer the popular thing, at least in, in many circles. Men or women are supposed to look like men. They're supposed to cut off their hair and, 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 and compete in the world of men. No, they should look feminine. They should look different. They should be the glory of the man. Uh, where were we? Verse, uh, verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. I've already preached a sermon on that. That's not a subject for now. Genesis chapter 6, I believe, is what that refers to. But Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. This is a very interesting terminology. Uh, these prepositions matter. The man is by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely or attractive or pretty that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Does it make sense for a woman to have short hair? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Now, he's, he's, he's talked about the glory of the man throughout this passage. And now he says, the long hair, that's a beautiful thing. And it's a feminine thing. And if you are a feminine, godly woman, you should want to look the part. That hair is given as a covering. Now, we've talked about authority for a lot of this passage as well. And he says that you're supposed to have that covering as a sign of authority over your head. And that, I believe, teaches that women are to have long hair as a sign of submission to their head. Not just a fashion statement. For her hair is given her for a covering. So why is it that many female preachers have short hair? You think that's a coincidence? Why is it, in many cases, the woman who is in submission to daddy, she then gets married to some wimp and cuts all her, cuts all her hair off? She gets what they call the married cut. Why is that? You think that's coincidence? No. Even if they don't consciously admit it or realize it themselves, that is a subconscious demonstration or expression of bucking their, their authority. They are no longer under dad's roof. They can do what they want. They've got some weenie man to, to boss around now. They can cut all their hair off. Child rearing and homemaking are considered inferior. Now think about this. It was not God. It was not the Bible who said homemaking is an inferior thing. It was the feminists. Man, true biblical Christianity elevates the woman to her rightful place of glory as God's nurturer of the man, as God's child rearer, of God's homemaker. It was the feminist movement who said, you should be ashamed of yourself. What do you mean you're just a homemaker? That was the feminist movement. That was the devil and his attack on the patriarchal family that robbed women of their glory and of their rightful place in God's ordained uh, hierarchy. Rather than stand firm on the scriptures and their teachings, the church has merely maintained a certain distance from the world. Now, 
we're starting to see what the world already was doing 10, 20, 30 years ago in the church because we don't stand on absolutes. We just kind of keep a certain amount of distance from the world. And so now in the church, we're starting to see feminist principles coming out. And today there's a certain political correctness, even in the pulpit. Preachers are, are scared to speak out on feminism. They're scared to put a woman in their place, right? Because, I mean, that sounds so sexist. Well, shame on us as men for not being the best and the most that we can be for God and protecting the women that God gave us to protect from this spiritual deception Amen. that robs them and enslaves them in the name of liberating them. And if you think about it, feminism is selfishness. And I think this is, an es- this is a point I really want to get across before I wrap up. Feminism says you can go do this you don't have to take care of your children. You can go and have a career. You don't need to take care of your man or obey your man. And so you can be fulfilled by going out and chasing your career or your, your dream, getting away from the hierarchy of men. And then what happens? Well, they're unfulfilled because they're not good at being men, and they're not trying very hard to be a woman, and so they have nothing. Feminism tells them that when they're a woman, they have no worth. It tells them that their only worth they can accomplish is in the world of men. True happiness comes from giving. It is better to give than to receive. And when men go out and, and work for their wives to, to, to feed them, to clothe them, to, uh, when they study their Bibles, to provide for them spiritually, that is a selfless act, and it gives men fulfillment. Women, when they give to their husbands, when they make uh, a good meal for him, when they train up the children and invest their lives into raising those children, that is where they find true fulfillment. It is better to give than to receive. Feminism teaches it is better to receive than to give. It is selfishness. That's what feminism ultimately is. It is not only rebellion against God's hierarchy, it is also selfishness. And when the devil comes to you and says, oh, well, you can have enlightenment, you can go get this, you can be selfish, you can have what you want, there's a trap, and that's the bait. And feminism is a trap, and the bait is liberation. And the Bible says that they will, they will not be liberated at all, but whoever serves sin is the, is the servant of sin. Whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. If you rebel against God's plan for your life, if you reject the blessings that he has for your life, then you have actually completely given yourself over to depression, to unfulfillment, to unhappiness. And that's why so many, even in the church today, are unfulfilled as housewives. They're depressed. They're frustrated because... They're not making any money or that something isn't quite right. They're fighting with their husband. These are oftentimes women in churches who are Bible believers because they, they're not good women. They're not investing themselves in being every bit the godly woman that he, God wants them to be. We are only happiest when we are in God's will. God's ways are best. And Hollywood has completely assassinated the woman. It's completely gotten rid of the godly woman. And in its place is a a career woman who doesn't listen to any man. She frequently corrects the man. He's usually portrayed as a wimp or a crazy man. Um, In fact, I started looking into the movies that don't have a godly, I mean, a a good mother figure of any kind. In fact, often if you look at children's movies, and of course Hollywood is the biggest child educator out there, you will find a very curious and odd phenomenon. Did you know that in almost every Disney movie there is either no mom, she's been killed, she's been captured, or she's absent, or she's a wicked stepmother? Why is that? She's certainly not a housewife because, ew, right? And if she is in the very few movies that Hollywood puts out, if she is in there, if there is a mother and she's portrayed in a positive light, it's usually because she's a career woman and she corrects her husband. Here's a few movies from just Disney uh, with prominent characters whose, whose mothers are killed, Captured or absent. Bambi, The Jungle Book, Pinocchio, Peter Pan, The Sword in the Stone, The Rescuers, The Great Mouse Detective, Oliver and Company, A Goofy Movie, The Rescuers Down Under, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Pocahontas, The Emperor's New Groove, Lilo and Stitch, Ratatouille, Tron, Big Hero 6, Snow White, Cinderella, Enchanted, Dumbo, The Fox and the Hound, The Little Mermaid, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Tarzan, Atlantis, Finding Nemo, Brother Bear, Frozen. The list goes on and on and on of movies that just, guess what, don't have a mother. Why? Because there's no place in the devil's economy for a godly woman who is everything that she can be who holds up her man and makes him everything he can be, and who protects and trains up her children to be the most godly people that they can be. And therefore, women today have no godly role models. They don't even know what they're supposed to be. Even women in the church often don't realize 
what they should be. And so they themselves, while not identifying as feminists, are not fulfilled. They're not happy as housewives. They're frustrated. We see this especially in uh, a new movie that just came out, a remake, Beauty and the Beast. I've, I've not seen this particular movie, but I know it's very familiar, I mean very similar to the original cartoon, which I did watch, and I found that amazing, that Belle is the quintessential feminist, and yet that movie is so popular in Christian circles. So popular in Christian circles. I grew up watching it. My sisters loved it. Most of the girls in my life loved that movie. Top five favorites, without a doubt. Beauty and the Beast. And yet, think about it. She sings, I want much more than this provincial life. She sings against um, Gaston, who proposed marriage to her. She said, Madam Gaston, can't you just see it? Madam Gaston, his little wife. No, sir, not me. I guarantee it. I want much more than this provincial life. She says, I've got much more than they, or I want much more than they've got planned. Well, God has wonderful plans for our lives. Amen. And if we ever try to outgrow those plans, you'll only find enslavement and, and discouragement. In fact, the only masculine character in the movie was Gaston, right? Who's a thug, who's a, who's a brute, who actually wants children and a wife to keep his home. How dare he? A man who, interestingly enough, wants to kill the beast. Remember we talked about where this is all headed? This is all headed to the beast new world order. And Gaston says, there's a beast up on the hill. He's coming for our children and our wives. That's a quote. And he's the villain. He says, it's time to take some action, boys. It's time to kill the beast. And he is the villain. The only manly man in the movie is the villain. The hero is the beast. Now remember, there's no mother in this movie. That's right. The father is a crackpot loon. And the woman is a feminist who runs into the arms of the beast with all of his lying signs and wonders. This is what Hollywood is teaching women in our churches. In conclusion, I would like to affirm that God's ways are always best. They are always the most liberating ideas. They are always the, the most happiness-inducing ideas. And that women are given by God the ability to be something that men can never be, and they should be it. They should strive to be the best women they can be, to be nurturing, to be loving, to be compassionate, to be house, uh, to homemakers, child rivers. These are the teachings of the Bible, and they are the will of God for our women. And when women embrace these teachings, they will find blessings in their children and in their housework and in their submission to their husband. They will find those things to be a blessing and happiness and riches. On the other hand, Satan's lies of feminism only leave our women unfulfilled, feeling meaningless, inadequate, undervalued. When they try to compete in the realm of men, they find they're not very good men and they're not very good women because they're too busy trying to be men. They're torn between two identities and they're never fully valued as ladies which God intended for them to be. The lies of feminism have robbed women of God's greatest blessings and made them think of them as burdens when they are truly God's gifts. When a woman embraces her God-given role, she finds fulfillment, respect. Men respect women who are women. She finds joy. And she finds honor as she excels and grows in that role. But when she leaves it, she can no longer appreciate the blessings of having children, of helping her man, of making a house into a home. If we're truly Bible believers, we trust God is right in everything. And everything he says in this book, we trust that his order is best, that his blessings are far greater than anything that we could go achieve for ourselves, and that what he wants to bless us with is far greater than any blessings that the world offers us, that the devil offers us. And scripture is filled with examples of people who tried to go and do it themselves and lost. When you try to go find your own fulfillment rather than taking God's fulfillment, you're not going to be fulfilled at all. True happiness comes in submission to our God-given authority, and the feminist attack on the patriarchal system of God's family is an attack on the woman, and it is an attack on the structure of the home and of God's blessings on us all.